Hey everybody, welcome to Hood Stories with me, your host, Big Joe, on the Loaded News Channel. Today I'm blessed to be with Dino. Dino is from the mob crew, Eastside, from the Aliso Village Projects. He's got a powerful story today. We're going to talk to Dino. Dino, how you doing? Thank doing you for good. joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, give you everybody your, your, your name and your, your street name. Well, as a break dancer, when, before we started my hood, they used to call me Kid Spider. And then when we started my my neighborhood, uh, it was sneaky. A lot of people right now just know me as D, Dino. Yeah, from Eastside TMC, the mob crew. All right, where is that located exactly? It's in Boyle Heights off of First Street in Gless, and the Liso Village Housing Projects. Yeah. Well, pretty famous out there for the LA area. Yeah. yeah Liso, the Liso uh, Village Projects, those are knocked down, right? They tore down the yeah, original Yeah, they tore ones? them um, down, I think, in 99, man. Yeah, uh, okay. they, they redid some newer projects you know but yeah you grew up right there in the project since i was yeah. four years old yeah so tell me your story of growing up there yeah well as a kid i didn't i didn't have a dad really active in my life you know he came around once in a while but not really active it was just my mom who took care of us and, and it was me my brother and, and my sister only at the time and and grow up, growing up in the projects you grew up you know with everybody in the neighborhood because you had like three different parts of the project four different parts of the project so you know, we grew up with everybody. You know, you know, black people. You know, Vietnamese, and some whites, very little, but you know, all, all races. So in time, you know, we start seeing stuff that was going on that was really normal to us. That may be different for others, you know. But it was just part of living in the projects, you know. Yeah. So growing up in the projects, like no matter what color you were, you were part of like the projects cliques. Where everybody was like family, right? Oh yeah. Like, you know, you needed you needed milk from somebody. You go to the neighbor's house and get it. Everybody had their doors open to you. How did that, your click, the the East Side Mob Crew, how did that get started? Well, I was one of the founders and we started off because, uh, you know, breakdancing started coming in and I got real involved in breakdancing and popping all that stuff. And that's how, it, that's why it was called the Mob Crew. In time, you know, we started going and, and challenging other breakdancing crews, but, you know, in time we started getting in fights and it just re evolved into a, a gang, you know, and, and and really, we didn't really see it as a gang because, you know, we grew up with each other. So, you know, it just evolved and, you know, things started happening where we had to start defending ourselves. And yeah. I lost, lost a lot of friends, man, a lot of friends that sometimes think like, what if we didn't, we didn't create this gang? What, what would have happened? Would they still be alive? Like you saying that you grew up and you guys didn't have like a lot of money, like in, and you guys were poor. Is that what got you started like in the drug trade? That was just part of life in the projects, you know? And I mean, either you did it or you didn't. And, and, and you learn to be a survivor in the project, no matter what, you know? And, and if you wanted a fresh pair of shoes, you know, your mom couldn't really afford it. You know, we had no other outlet, you know? My choice was to start drug dealing. I did it for a lot of years and so did a lot of homies and, and we became a, a strong force when it came to that that lifestyle what age would you say that you remember that you guys officially became a gang i think unofficially even when we just started break dancing yeah we were already a tight unit you yeah. know i'm thinking like 15 years old yeah. it, it kind of like immediately started happening where people wanting to, to go against us and fight with us and, and it was just it was already there we're project babies so you know it was always you know we had that mentality of, of violence already just growing up the things that are cemented in our minds are more like in the negative or the traumatizing because that causes the PTSD for, for a lot of homeboys, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was a couple murders that I, I, I witnessed, you know, and and it, it changed me, you know? You know, this was maybe late 80s, early 90s. We had a good friend of ours from a different neighborhood uh, that was uh, alongside of us at the time. Our, our They were clicked up with us too. He was like one of the main guys from that, from that, that neighborhood and he had happened to get arrested for something. I don't know what it was, but we all got our money together and we bailed him out because it, it was his birthday. So we decided to um, to all get together and let's jump in the cars and let's go cruising the lake lake and, and Pico. Let's go meet some girls and do whatever it is we were going to do, you yeah. know. And we went pretty deep. It was a good 15, 16 of us and a couple car loads and he, he was in my car. Keep in mind we were all heated, you know, we were always heated, protected, you know. We ended up going up the hill to go gas up and put gas in the car and stuff. and. Sure enough, I don't know how or what, but enemies must have saw us, and a big gunfight just erupted in the, at the gas station. It, it was huge. 
where he lasted a long time. And yeah, out of all the people that were there, he was the only one that got shot, right? You were saying? The only the one. The only one that wanted to pass it, yeah. Yeah, passing away. We tried to get him in the car and, and um, put my hand there also to try to, you know, stop the bleeding and, you know, but he didn't make it. That's we should have not bailed him out because, you know, yeah. but who knows what was in store for his life, you know. Because if you really think about like the lives that we used to live, it was like we lived in the military. It was the battleground. Yeah, right there. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I do, I suffer from that. You know, I have a lot of like nightmares and, and there could be an old man next to me, a harmless old man. And in my mind, the way my mind thinks is like, man, is, is he gonna shoot me? Like I'm thinking this guy wants to shoot me, you know, cause I've always lived that life of having to, you know, watch my back and, and 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 when I look, this man's not even looking at me. It's like it's all in my mind. It's because of everything that I went through. And you know, you're down for your neighborhood. You're down for your homies. But in the end of the story, the biggest victims are your parents. You know what I mean? Your loved ones that love you. Or if you die, you know what I mean? They're the ones carrying your casket. They're the ones missing you. And it's painful. Like I lost my best friend. You know, Sal, Green Eyes. And um, this guy was a knockout artist. His mistake was turning his back to this guy and guy went behind him which was like a wrestling coach or some some sort they were actually partying together for his birthday and and when they went to go buy more beer and and um got in a little argument and you know greeny knocked him out greeny grabbed stuff and walked away and guy went behind him broke the neck so greeny lasted for you know a good three weeks but his body started shutting down and and i got the phone call to to, to come and Come, you know, maybe he'll he'll talk to you. Come, the mom called me, and I got to the hospital as quick as possible. And it's like if he waited for me, you know, because he ended up being paralyzed. And I held his hand, and as soon as I held his hand, I'm looking at him, and I'm like crying, like, yeah, it's... like don't, like don't die, man. Like I love you, Greeny. Like I got an apartment, and I'm gonna take care of you on the first floor, don't die. And like he felt me because like just one tear came down. And I could feel, I don't know how to explain it, but I could feel his spirit leaving his body. He was my best friend, man. Like a homie in the hood, we went through a lot of stuff together and, and I, I lost him to this. And even guys that were our enemies, we grew up, you know, as kids, playing with them and, and end up at, you know, sworn enemies. At. I want to say, you know, rest in peace to Greeny, you know, and man, what you're seeing right now here is uh, a true man. To be able to shed a tear for, for his brother, you know what I mean, that he grew up with, because it takes a true man to be able to express his feelings. People say, well, you got to be macho, you can't shed a tear, you got to always be strong. And you know, that that's just, part of that world that's fake you know what i mean yeah so, and sometimes yeah. like holding holding all that anger in and because i know that as a kid i was i was always angry I, you know and i know where it stems from you know but i was always angry and i was always the small guy so i was always picked on and i always thought i had to be be the one you know i was never a great fighter you know me being so angry as a kid and growing up and holding all these emotions in and, and it, it made it worse because my heart it, it just it turned black. Like I said, opening up the door in the projects, we were a product of our environment. This is what we knew. This is how we lived. Man, nothing else mattered. You know, we were called the kids from down there. And these were teachers talking about us, calling us the kids from down there. Like, like, dude, like, what do you mean the kids from down there? We didn't understand, but now we think about it, you know? Yeah, well, what got you started into dealing? Cadillac, money, jewelry, and this is what got me wanting that lifestyle. And I didn't have all that, but you know, a lot of the homies did. I'm living that gangster life and, and, and wanting people to know who you were. This is D, this is sneaky right here, and this is how I'm gonna go out. You wanted to like that Tony Montana go out in the oh, blaze yeah. of glory, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Always, always wanted that power, like you said, like Scarface, like. Yeah. It wasn't about the money, it was about the power. It was about the, the, the principles principle. about yeah. it or whatever it was that was gonna make people embed my name in their mind and never forget me. There really are no really like hood legends, you know what I mean, that people really remember or they light candles for these days. So yeah, it would have been a loss to lose you out there on the streets, you know? So what led you like 
be at the point where you're saying, I'm not going to do this drug game no more. When I was going to go to court, um, this was in 2015, to get sentenced, I still was, you know, battling my, my issues with selling drugs and all this stuff. And, and that night that, that I was going to go to court, I made that choice. That, that was it. I was facing a good 10 or 15 years. You know, my attorney was like, don't expect nothing less than four to five years. Yeah. You know, the, the murder I was arrested for, you know, the attempted murder the, the year later, I already had accepted it. I went to court and, and um, I got to read my statement to the judge and I had letters from Father Greg, my friend Celeste Freeman, she was a reporter for the Times. A lot of people wrote letters for me because they knew that my changes were already happening and people could see it. I read the statement to the judge and the judge like telling the, the, the DA and everybody in the court, like, how are we going to put this man back into prison and corrupt him again? After the judge made her statement about not letting me, wanting me to go to prison, she asked the DA, do you have any further statements against Mr. Aguilar? He did not stand up. Mr. Aguilar, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you 14 months of house arrest. All these hours of community service, my attorney was like in awe. Everybody could not believe that I didn't get any time. I knew then that that was God and that's where my faith went up the roof. What's next for Dino? I want to reach out to, to, to different lifestyles, whether you're black, white, you know, Oriental, whatever. To me, that doesn't matter. It's a matter of, of how, how I can serve the Lord better and how, how I can be better. I'm still learning myself. Like on the music scene, what do you got coming next? This is a, the lyrics to the, the song, my, um, The Beginning, it's called The Beginning, that I wrote a, a couple of weeks ago, and this is a, a Christian song that I'm going to be um, filming. It's part of, um, part of my, uh, my testimony. So I'm going to read it as a poem and not rap it. I feel the power of God flowing through my veins, releasing all of my stresses and all these horrible pains. And I can feel it now. It's like my heart was unfrozen. I'm a child of God. It's not a fluke I was chosen. So now I gear up with the armor of God. My belt of truth on my waist. This is not a facade. 